The weekly cybercrime and business podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs delivers cyber risk intelligence solutions that help organizations understand the potential for cyber attacks, determine the impact of their business, and proactively address threats head on. Hey everyone out there, today is Friday, July 10th, 2015. I am Jeff Peters, Surfwatch Labs editor. I'm here with Matt Leifus, Surfwatch Labs writer, and Michael Fell, Surfwatch Labs cyber risk intelligence analyst. A little bit later, after the latest news and our discussion, we have an interview with Kurt Wilson. Kurt is the senior research analyst with Arbor Networks, and he recently wrote a post about some stuff going on in the dark web and some cybercrime tools that cybercrime actors are using there. So we chat about the dark web and those tools and kind of how uh, the cybercrime as a service model uh, works. So that's coming up in a little bit. But first, I'll throw it over to you, Matt, for the top cyber headlines from the past week. Coming in at number three this week, we had Orlando Health Incorporated. The hospital recently announced a data breach that potentially affects about 3,200 patients. The company said the breach stems from activity of a former employee after this employee accessed patient records between January 2014 and May 2015. As a result of the employee's actions, three other healthcare facilities uh, were also uh, affected, uh, including Winnie Palmer Hospital, Dr. Phillips Hospital, and Orlando Regional Medical Center. Coming at number two, kind of a update story. We recently, uh, in a prior podcast, and we spoke about this, but we have uh, Firekeepers Casino. Initially, the casino announced the discovery of a data breach of their systems uh, back on April 16th. However, this week the casino concluded that about 85,000 payment cards were compromised in the breach, and also that some current and former employees, as well as their dependents, had some personal information compromised. And this information included social security numbers, driver's license numbers, healthcare benefit selections, and medical billing information. And coming in at number one for the week, we have Plex. The popular media server company announced this week that the server hosting the company's forums and blog was hacked on July 1st. User passwords were reset as a result. Also, a hacker going by the handle Savica uh, claimed credit for the attack on Reddit. Savica claimed to have data from Plex as a result from the breach and demanded a ransom payment of 9.5 Bitcoin in exchange for not releasing the data that they're claiming to have. Those are the top trending industry targets for the week. Uh, to kick it off this week, guys, for discussion, we're talking about top industry targets. Well, we have a new reigning industry target across all sectors, finally knocking off the Office of Personal Management after their five-week reign. And that's uh, the hacking team breach, which is showing up in headlines throughout the week. I was wondering if we could kind of kick off the discussion there, guys. Yeah, it seemed like everyone out there was talking about this uh, breach at hacking team. Like you said, they're, they're an Italian surveillance company, and they've been in the news quite a bit, basically for selling exploits to different governments and law enforcement agencies, and they've kind of been a little bit of hot water and on whether they're selling to, you know, Oppressive regimes, basically, has kind of been the accusation. So what happened was the company was breached and a 400 gig torrent was released, which included client lists, internal emails, and source code. Recently, just on Thursday, WikiLeaks made the, the more than 1 million emails searchable. So there's been a lot of articles going on around there about who they're selling to, what kind of exploits they had, things like that. They're in a little bit of hot water because their sales to the Russian secret police, the FSB, as well as regimes in Sudan, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia. Um, the FBI is on there as well. They paid over 700000 to this company since 2011. In, in responding to those allegations, the hacking team head of communications, he said that they have not sold to any blacklisted countries, at least when they were on the blacklist. So his, what he's basically saying is that you know they might have sold to Sudan or Saudi Arabia or or different countries, but which countries are on those blacklists change. Some people believe that, some people don't. But yeah, I guess one of the big things that came out of there was there was some zero-day exploits that the company had. I think uh, Surfwatch Labs put out an alert on that, right, Mike? 
Yeah, that's correct. Pretty much there's a flash zero day. Um, that's what the alert was issued for and a Microsoft kernel zero day. Um, more on the flash zero, it was an unknown flash vulnerability until this information from hacking team was released. And soon after the zero day was published and discussed on, on the web, criminals responsible for the Angler, Neutrino, and Nuclear Pack exploit kits incorporated the zero day into those kits. Trend Micro said this exploit was also used in limited attacks in Korea and Japan. Most significantly, these took place before the hacking team leak took place. We first found this activity on July 1st. So that's, that was an interesting tidbit, but luckily Adobe issued a patch on Tuesday fixing the vulnerability. Microsoft has yet to issue a patch. One of the interesting things about this breach is all the emails obviously got leaked, and I think it was the hacking team CEO just a month ago. He, was, he sent the email to his, to his employees basically saying, you know, imagine this, a, a leak on WikiLeaks showing you explaining the evilest technology on Earth. And he basically goes on to say that we would be demonized by our dearest friends. And then, of course, a month later, now they breached and WikiLeaks, of course, has a million emails searchable. So just a little bit ironic. And some people are speculating whether the company's even going to survive. But I guess we'll kind of have to wait and see how that plays out. They did say that they are going to continue on. So I guess I'm assuming it'd be a wait and see sort of game. But it's been a pretty busy week of news. There's been a lot of crazy stories. Obviously, this hacking team one's sort of the biggest uh, one at the moment. But there's also a story about German missiles being hacked, right, Matt? Yeah, and th this is a really interesting story. It kind of goes along the line. Sometimes we talk about fear mongering and uh, things like that, but this sounded like it, it could be a, a legitimate threat. A German missile system stationed on the Turkish-Syrian border was reportedly hacked by a foreign source and carried out what's being called unexplained commands. A German magazine suggests hackers may have gained access to the missile system through a computer chip which guides the missiles or through a real-time information exchange which allows the missiles to communicate with their control system likely with the goal of remotely operating the missile or stealing data. Now, guys, obviously I'm of the opinion where, you know, we're talking about uh, the potential takeover of a missile. Now, I mean, it, it didn't say, it, it's unexplained, like, what the command was or anything. But we're talking about a hacker taking over a missile. That's pretty scary and tense and probably should be taken seriously. What do you guys think of that? A spokesman came out and said that an attack is extremely unlikely, and and also in terms of actually launching a missile, the the goal they were speculating was you know of remotely operating the missile or of stealing data. But in terms of actually you know launching a missile and you know trying to kill somebody or start a war or something, I'm not super knowledgeable on how that works. But I know from what I've read, you know, there's usually you got to have a couple people with different codes and stuff as well. So even if you know, a hacker were able to get into the system, they wouldn't be able to likely do any anything too crazy, at least from what I've read. But then I've also read other people who this week have been saying that it's possible that there's a lot more stuff like this that goes on. It just doesn't really make the news because obviously the security implications, you know, people aren't going to run to CNN and, and tell everyone all about it. So, yeah, it's definitely worrisome, but I don't think, you know, we got to worry about someone necessarily launching a missile and, and starting something. Whether it's possible or not remains to be seen. I, I still take it seriously. But then we have news. What was it? Yesterday we heard uh, news about the New York Stock Exchange possibly going down, and, and immediately everyone's thinking, oh, you know, it's some type of cyber attack. But that really wasn't the case, was it, Mike? No, it wasn't. The, what ended up happening with the New York Stock Exchange is that the night prior they pushed an update, and the update didn't take well and shut down trading starting in the late morning on Wednesday. In addition, we had United Airlines, which had to ground flights in the morning for about two hours. The reason behind the grounding was that there was a router failure in one of United Airlines' networks. But a lot of the concern that was during media reports was like, is this a cyber attack? I think it's just the sign of the times that we live in. You know, we just have these knee-jerky reactions now. 
I think if there's any sort of technical difficulty, everyone's first assumption is that it's a cyber attack. Well, everyone needs to just slow down. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. And you have to look at data and information. And what is the reasoning behind this technical difficulty? Is it an attack? Is it something malicious? Or is it a big oops? Yeah, and I, I like watching these events kind of play out on Twitter because you get a lot of reactions. And it's one of my favorite places to get the news. But everyone definitely overreacts on there. I was kind of cracking up when everyone was was tweeting out, you know, the live footage from the stock exchange and then, you know, show show Bane down there from the Batman movies, you know, shooting everybody. <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of trolling like that going on. But, yeah, it is interesting that pretty much any time any site goes down or anything happens, you know, the first reaction right away is that everyone just assumes it's a cyber attack. So I think everyone's pretty sensitive to that nowadays, especially after all the stuff that's happened the last couple of years. Which, in a way, actually, you, you could make the argument that, yeah, yeah, a lot of it, it probably isn't needed. But I guess part of it is also kind of a good thing because there is so much uncertainty and people just don't have the knowledge about cybersecurity. I wish that they would apply that knee-jerk reaction when it came to, like, protecting their personal data versus freaking out when, like, a big organization or something like that has an outage and everyone's freaking out, oh, it's a cyber attack. Um, but at least, I, I don't know, maybe at least that there's a little bit more public knowledge of that these things can happen. That that can't be a complete bad thing. Yeah, and like I said, there was just a whole lot of news stories this week. I was looking through our data and just saw a lot of stuff related to consumer goods. And I know you cover consumer goods a lot, Matt, but I saw stuff in there, you know, like about a zoo. I saw a radio station, uh, more stuff with casinos. Just seems like there's a lot. A lot happening in that sector, which is kind of interesting considering really this year we haven't seen, especially the beginning, the first quarter of 2015, we didn't really see a lot of activity in that sector. Yeah, a lot of people are predicting that 2015 was going to be the, a monumental year in terms of, you know, of like cybersecurity breaches in the consumer goods sector, especially when it came to uh, point of sale terminals. With it concerning the the Detroit Zoo gift shop, that was actually their third party vendor was breached. But this week really de demonstrated the wide range of ways that consumer good targets are targeted. I mean, you know, we had DDoS against uh, Atlantic City Online Casinos, like Jeff said. Um, we had a Denver based radio station that was taken offline. And not only was it taken offline, a lot of their information was actually stolen and wiped, so they actually lost a lot of information that they had to gather over a lot of months. So a lot of things happening this week, and like I said, really highlights the different ways that people can become a victim uh, in this uh, consumer goods sector. Yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you guys about real quick before we wrap up here and move on to the interview was, I don't know if you guys have followed this Lizard Squad conviction, the 17-year-old hacker that's, that was affiliated with Lizard Squad, uh, he was convicted of 50,700 charges. So I saw the headline. I was thinking, man, they're really uh, <laughs> coming down hard on this kid. But it turns out that he's not going to receive any jail time. He j it's just a, a two-year suspended sentence. So a lot of people are, are talking about that and you know whether that's a fair sentence or not. So I just since that was one of the bigger stories really since Christmas... Uh, everyone's been talking about Lizard Squad. Wondering if you guys had any thoughts on that. How and the kid and he's just a teenager, correct? Yeah, he's he's seventeen years old, at least according to the, the article I read. Well, I mean, I think you have to look at this from perspective. In this country, we have this easy solution of just throwing everyone in prison, and sometimes it's detrimental to. I mean, it costs money to put people into prison. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars to maintain these prisons, U.S. prison system. But I think in Scandinavia, they have a different sort of outlook on it, I guess you can say. I think there's like a country to country sort of, you have to look at it from the fin Finnish point of view. He is a nonviolent offender. He probably won't be able to touch a computer until he's 21. And there's probably no no point of really putting this kid in prison since especially he's a minor and you never know. He, I don't know. It's just, I think it's just a matter of perspective. You have to step back as American. You have to step back and kind of look at the way people in other countries view punish crime and punishment. 
That's a good point, Mike. One thing, and obviously we don't, I'm sure none of us are experts in how they conduct the law in Finland, which is where a, a lot of this uh, carried out. But do you think do you think the punishment would have been more severe had he been 18 and an adult? Yeah, so so I live in Wisconsin, and here uh, there was a pretty big story. Uh, I think it was in late 2013. But a, a 38-year-old man was sentenced to two years of federal probation and a fine of $183,000 for taking part in a, a DDoS attack that was organized by Anonymous. Um, I believe in that story, like it was just for 60 seconds, you know, he launched like a, a low orbit ion cannon, one of the tools that a lot of these hacktivists use. And, you know, so it just seems so haphazard how these sentences get handed down. You know, in one case, you got this guy getting fined nearly $200,000 for taking part in this. And then you have this lizard squad case where I, th- I believe that he was fined like less than $10,000 and, you know, just the, the two year suspended sentence. On Twitter, Lizard Squad tweeted after the news of the of the sentencing came out. They said all the people that said we would rot in prison don't want to comprehend what we've been saying since the beginning. We we have free passes. So pretty much that's what Lizard Squad's been saying is that, you know, they're not 18, they have free passes, they can just do whatever the heck they want. So I guess it's, you know, it's a tough situation when you're talking about minors. So moving on, we got a really quick cyber tip of the week. We were talking a lot about the hacking team breach earlier, and we've talked on this podcast quite a bit about using good passwords, and it's one of those messages that you hear everyone saying again and again and again, and you almost get sick of repeating it and hearing it. So it was kind of interesting that here we have this sophisticated, supposedly sophisticated hacking company that's developing these zero-day exploits and stuff, and according to reports, one of their security engineers he used the password password with a zero across all systems, according to some of the leaked documents. And some of the other passwords they used were, were password with a four instead of an A. Another reason to point out, especially for businesses, that obviously if you have these hacking companies that can't go through the trouble of developing strong passwords, that's a good chance that your employees uh, might not be using good password habits as well. Now we'll move on to our interview with Kurt Wilson. He's the Senior Research Analyst with Arbor Networks, and we chat about the dark web and some research that he did on some of the cybercrime tools that you can find there, particularly related to DDoS attacks. get started you recently wrote about some tools that are available for hackers on the criminal underground so i was hoping that you could tell our listeners a little bit about how that criminal underground world works and what kind of tools are are the most prominent there well there's a lot going on in the underground you know we have what can be called the dark web or the deep web you know which is typically defined as content that's not indexed by search engines I would like to expand that a little bit, you know, some content that requires a special process, let's say Tor client or I2P or or even just something that that, that is a very specific exclusive underground form. I would also call the the deep web. So Silk Road of course is a famous example that got a lot of press, but there's a lot of other forums. There's um just today I was looking and uh I found a list of like 45 underground forums. And a lot of these are are uh, you know uh, real world criminals that have just simply moved to the internet. They're selling drugs and uh, every kind of service and fake IDs and everything imaginable. But also mixed in there, we have you know a variety of hacking related content. Everything from uh, you know hire a hacker and uh, you know sell of, sale of exploits, sale of DDoS. Um, I came across on one of the um, dark web forums. I came across one of the forum operators chatting with a DDoS botmaster and setting up a scheme to pay that botmaster to try to take down all of the other dark web forums so so that his market could stay online. So just a lot of this going on, you know, every kind of uh, place for exploits, data leaks, and sale of credentials, carding. And some of these sites are unreliable. Some of them are exit scams. They set up and then uh, they stop delivering content after a while and take the money and run. And so I guess there's no honor among thieves. <laughs> Underground forums have been around for, for years and years and years, going all the way back to the 80s with 
underground bulletin boards that were only accessible through a, a very closed community and typically sometimes with credentials. So definitely not a new phenomenon. It's just it's just taking a new expression and uh, getting a little bit harder to trace. So yeah, that's a little bit about the kind of the threat landscape. And uh, there's a lot of Russian underground forums as well that that uh, talk a lot about DDoS and then carding and exploit code and this sort of thing. And so roaming around these forums, I came across some some content that uh, that I ended up going into the Attack of the Shuriken 2015 blog that I wrote recently. I wonder if you could talk to me a little bit about some of those tools that, that you found and, and kind of what is out there in terms of, I assume it was mainly the DDoS stuff that you were looking at? Um, in this case, yes. I mean, we, we take a look at, uh, you know, advanced threats, you know, slash APT and, and cybercrime related activity, cybercrime malware, banking trojan, this sort of thing, but also DDoS. Um, in this case, I was looking at the stressor services, and these stressor services are basically DDoS for hire, and they started off some time back. Um, they were typically just known as booters at the time, and they were positioned to be used to uh, knock uh, gamers offline, so boot the gamer offline um, for competitive advantage. And that still happens. But uh, we have now the underground market of what they call SST, server stress testing. And SST is it's basically running DDoS attacks on servers, and they're sort of positioned as being quasi-legitimate. But uh, basically, all the people running these are doing it. In the background, they're compromising servers and using those servers to launch spoofed attacks. And they're continually doing that because they're getting shut down, and they continue to build new infrastructure. So there have been just a million stressor services and booter services over the years. And I profiled one that was particularly noisy in terms of advertising on one of the underground forums called VDOS Stressor. And VDOS Stressor, I profiled it in the blog, and it offers a lot of the same types of things that many of the other stressors offer. You pay more money, you get more time to launch your attacks and the attack infrastructure varies in terms of the, the bandwidth and the actual attack capability that is available is going to vary depending upon how many servers they have running as well as the bandwidth of those servers as well as how many people are using those servers at once. Uh, so sites that have good DDoS protection typically aren't bothered by these sorts of things. But people that don't have DDoS protection can really uh, go through a lot of pain as a result of these, uh, these services. And um, there's a lot of code floating around the underground, a lot of malicious code that gets slightly modified and reused to launch different types of DDoS attacks. And a VDoS stressor is no different. And it appears that the source code for the back end of that stressor has leaked. And so anybody can set up their own stressor. And so there's been an awful lot of fly-by-night stressor services. They show up, they're around for a little while, they take some money maybe launch a few attacks and then they uh, take the money and run or they close up shop or they realize that it's a lot of work to keep it going. But there are, there are so many of these, it makes it extremely easy for anyone that has a grudge with anybody for any reason, whether it be gaming, nihilism, an attack on a site for strategic purposes, an attack on a website just simply to test to see if it's available to go down. And also, you may have heard of the DD4BC, the DDoS for Bitcoin attacks that have been taking place for well over a year now. Well, um, there are indications based on the types of attacks that this, uh, we believe it's one person. This, we believe it's just a, it's a guy. There are indications that this guy is using stressor services and probably more than one in order to launch his attacks. So that's just a little bit about the stressor services and there's, three or four different people that have been running this one particular, this v, VDOS stressor service. And uh, there are just thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, and possibly more attacks that are being launched from these infrastructures. Um, and typically they're very cheap. So you don't have to spend very much money at all. And uh, sometimes these services, they lie. They say, oh, yes, we, we're the best, and we've got such high capability. So I did my best to validate some of the claims that were posted on the underground forum. And as a result of uh, taking a look at our Atlas infrastructure, I was able to validate that some of the attacks that they, they launched were actually true and the bandwidth actually matched what they claimed. So uh, definitely some, some substantial attack capability here. And it's just so easy. It's really all just point and click. 
the end users don't have to know a darn thing. All they have to do is click a button, put in their target, and it goes. Just wondering if you have a sense of, or I don't know if it's even possible to get a sense of how many customers, you know, like say this VDOS services is getting and how many people are using it. Sometimes these sites get compromised and a database leak. So they have, say, a SQL injection bug, and someone gets in there and they, they obtain everything. They slurp up all the databases, and it ends up in a dump that goes out to the underground. And I've seen thousands of users on some of these. Uh, some of the smaller ones that don't last long have fewer users. Some of the ones that try to keep a lower profile may have fewer users. But typically thousands of users is what I'm seeing for the ones that are prominent and the ones that are advertising a lot. Yeah, and a lot's been written about, you know, the cybercrime as a service model and how it's closing the gap between the sophisticated and the more unsophisticated attackers. You know, for example, like you said, I can buy an exploit kit, I can buy the infrastructure to deliver it. Um, is that something that you guys are seeing on the DDoS side as well, where basically attackers without a lot of skill are able to perform these big attacks? Or is there still, um, you think, a gap between, you know, those, those massive attacks that we see and, and kind of everything else? Well... There's a lot of attack activity that comes from what I would call script kitties or you know, aggravated gamers. But the Lizard Squad recently, uh, they launched, uh, what was it, 400 gigs? Or I'd, I'd actually have to go check my records. But they launched some really pretty powerful damaging attacks. And they had their own stressor services, and they were leveraging hacked home routers for this, um, as well as probably other infrastructure as well. So it's a big mix. You've got... I think that the intent, people that are using these booter and stressor services, they're not necessarily as gung-ho as, say, some of the hacktivist types of attacks. Like, for instance, in, uh, back in 2012-2013, uh, the Operation Ababil attacks using infrastructure that we called Brobot, those are very ideolog ideologically motivated. And some of the back-end code that, that they were using that was written in PHP and deployed on, on high-end servers with high bandwidth. That is very similar to the model of a stressor or a booter. And they didn't have a, a convenient and friendly web front end that we know of. They, um, they may have had one that we just didn't see somewhere. Um, but very similar in, in, uh, in style, just there was a different in, difference in intent and a different intensity of attack. So, for instance, on the stressor services, you're not necessarily going to have, after a while, Someone's just going to give up if, if they're not really very motivated. Um, so the script kitties and whatnot, those that only have the skills to click a few buttons, and if a site has protection, they'll probably just leave it and move on. Now, sometimes they might try to adapt. But a more, a more targeted threat actor, such as the guys that were doing the Operation Ababil attacks, they will analyze the defenses, and they will work around the defenses. So there's definitely a different class of attackers. But as far as this becoming easy and accessible um, and whatnot, um, yeah, it, it's really a piece of cake. I mean, you get in, you pay a little bit of money, and you can launch attacks. And you know, people can build their own. All of this code has leaked as well. So it doesn't take that much for someone to go out and build their own. It doesn't take very long on the underground forums to find servers that can be used to launch spoofed attacks. And before you know it, you have people that have very little skill that are launching uh, um, amplification reflection attacks um, that can be quite damaging on unprepared targets and cause a lot of collateral damage. One thing I'm wondering is, is if these tools are really changing in any significant way over time, or are they kind of the same as you know they were, say, a year ago? Yes, there have been some changes. Often what I'm seeing is are slight modifications to existing code. So, for instance, there's an attack. There's attack code out there that does a spooked sin flood. So attackers will take it. They will modify a few bits. They will modify a little bit. And they will hope that that modification is enough to get around various defenses. And in some cases, it might be. But a lot of times, it's, it's just continues to be more noise for sites that have um, adequate defense. Um, some attackers do try to innovate. And they are trying to do some new things. But generally speaking, the crude DDoS attacks still work fairly well. And the high volumetric floods from the amplification and reflection attacks still work quite well for any, any unprepared target um, and with a lot of collateral damage. So there is some innovation. The innovation is often overhyped in the underground. Wow, look at our great new cool attack tool. We'll call it, you know, the flaming skull of death or something. 
<laughs> but it, it turns out that it's just a slight modification to existing code. So if you're looking at the attack on the wire, there's a very tiny, subtle change. Um, and otherwise, the attack traffic is very similar. And you have attackers trying to innovate in terms of they'll set up scripts to make it easier to target specific services or specific types of serv specific types of servers that listen on, say, port X. They will modify the scripts and they will offer, okay, we're going to flood service X now. And then uh, the, the miscreant that's bought the services simply has to click on a box and an amplification reflection flood then is launched towards that service. And the people that are running these underground services will then posit that as a new attack type. And all it really is is the same attack type aimed in a slightly different way. So there is some innovation, but not a whole lot. And um, having worked with computer security for many years, I've seen a lot of advisories over time. I see advisories for, say, like Cisco Gear, for instance, or, or other routing infrastructure. And uh, there's some sort of denial of service bug that's found in their software. Some specific type of crafted packet in some sequence will bring that gear down. And I keep waiting for DDoS threat actors to latch on to these sorts of things. Uh, but the reality is that in order to get at bugs like that, they would have to reverse engineer like Cisco IOS updates, for instance. And that's a lot of work. And so most of these people are still getting return on investment from the, the same crude attacks that have been around for many, many, many years. So they don't need to innovate. So anyway, to, to sum it up, yes, there have been some innovations. The innovations often tend to be incremental. Every now and then something new and big does come along. And typically, like for instance, there was a, uh, an attack called HashDOS. And then many years back, there was Slow Loris and uh, different, types of, different types of attacks. And after they come along and become popular, they will soon be integrated into these stressor services. So attacks come along, some researcher finds a new attack. If the attack is meaningful, the people running the stressor services will then integrate that into their toolkits. So innovation happens in that way as well. So say a you know, security researcher finds a new problem, and we can expect that to show up too if it has any uh, substantiability to it. Yeah, that's pretty much all the questions that I have, unless there's anything else you wanted to touch on. Well, what I find interesting is that this article has focused on, on DDoS services in particular, um, but there's just a whole, you know, corrupt criminal underground marketplace, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, overlap between, you know, malicious infrastructure. So you've got, like, you know, people that are running spam bots and people that are using exploit kits, and you've got some DDoS activity taking place on some of the same types of bulletproof, uh, bulletproof hosting services. Um, you've got people in the underground offering all types of services, everything from, you know, special exploit kits to DDoS services and stressors and just a big, a big kind of sort of litter box of, uh, of threat activity all, all taking place at once and a lot of intermixing. And I think that we can expect to see DDoS to continue to be integrated within the context of other cybercrime, for instance, creating a distraction while some type of other some type of other more serious cybercrime takes place. I mean, DDoS is serious, don't get me wrong. If you're knocked offline, you can't do business, that's bad. But if you've got someone launching a, um, a confidentiality or an integrity attack, say, for instance, uh, stealing banking credentials, performing wire fraud and whatnot, and they're using a DDoS attack to create a smoke screen to cover this up, this is a problem, and, and financial institutions are well aware of this tactic. Um, but we're going to see more of that, you know, as, as attackers continue to get um, creative and whatnot. So uh, the whole underground is just going to just keep rolling. There's just really no end in sight. Thanks for listening to this week's Cybercrime and Business Podcast. As always, you can find us on iTunes, YouTube, and all the major podcasting sites. And for more information, check out surfwatchlabs.com.